Hey class, so today we're going to talk about something a little more serious. We're going to be going deep into extreme culture and how social media exacerbates that issue. And we're going to be asking a bunch of tough questions about what it does and how social media puts us into these places where extreme culture doesn't exist just on the fringe and on social media and digital spaces, but actually crosses over into physical space a lot of times in very dangerous ways. So today we're gonna to talk about a couple of examples of things that have happened over the course of the last decade or so that have brought us to start talking about this in a serious academic manner. There's been a fair amount of study on CVE, countering violent extremism, for about 10 years now in terms of social media. I'm part of a CVE group that includes journalists, academics, uh, researchers, and what we do is we kind of scour the web to find out where people are residing, what they're doing, and what they're actually doing when it takes to the streets. What happens when the social media actually activates somebody, turns them beyond the use of the web and just kind of shitposting to something where they're actually carrying flags into the US Capitol. How does that happen? What does that actually do? And why does social media or maybe better question, is social media the cause of that? So I think today we're gonna to start with an example. I think we're gonna start with something called, uh, about a story about Carol. And this story is something that just recently came out and it's a story about Carol's journey to QAnon. And the story goes like this. In the summer of 2019, Carol Smith joined Facebook. Carol Smith joined the, the platform and basically just started liking things and doing the setup pages, things that are meant for uh, how you kind of onboard yourself onto a social media platform. She added her, her personality profile, so to speak. And the personality profile was that she was a politically conservative mother from Wilmington, North Carolina. By adding those details in, Facebook suggests to you certain pages that you might be interested in, things that might lead you to a better Facebook experience. We know how these things go. And what it did is it suggested two initial pages that are pretty standard for what you would assume a Facebook or any social media platform would suggest for you. It suggested Fox News and Donald Trump. I mean, it's the president. Why would that, why would that be an issue when it's a platform? Fox News being a television channel, a mainstream media channel. So these simply are added. However, over the course of the next several days, Carol's feed started showing her suggestions to groups. At the time, Facebook had prioritized in their algorithm groups, meaning places where people can go that are private, things that aren't on the main feed, parts of Facebook that aren't part of the public sphere or the news feed. Groups were supposed to be this friendly space where families can talk and get together and communicate in places that aren't really open to the public. And these groups that were being suggested to her were a bunch of QAnon pages, lots of them. And I mean not just one or two, but dozens of QAnon pages. QAnon, as you probably know by now, is a, comp a conspiracy theory, a completely false conspiracy theory, based on a very extreme idea that uh, the Democrats are a cabal of cannibalistic pedophiles. All of this is fake. It's made up. It's based on a, uh, the current fear manic that comes from a multitude of conspiracies, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But here's the interesting thing about Carol. Carol isn't real. She doesn't exist at all. Carol was made up. And she wasn't just made up by somebody to see how it works, but I do occasionally using sock puppets, where you create fake accounts to kind of navigate the platform and figure things out. Carol was invented by Facebook. Carol was an internal study designed by Facebook to see what happens in the effects of the platform and what they actually do. Carol's story, or Carol's journey to QAnon, comes from Francis Hogan's testimony to Congress last week, as part of the tens of thousands of leaked pages that she brought out into the space. And this is an end point for us to kind of see what's happened over the course of the last decade with Facebook's ability to kind of radicalize its users through its suggestive tools, suggestion tools, which is the predictive algorithm as to what you might like or what you might like to join. So before we get back to QAnon and the extreme behaviors that have caused not only several kidnappings and several deaths that are horrific, and I won't go into detail on this, this lecture specifically, but what are the things that have actually amplified hate speech and extremism into our physical space over the course of the last decade? Of course, we could talk about Pepe ad nauseum, which we won't, to not today at least, but I'd like to talk about some history, some, some understanding of how social media itself became the platform for uh, extremist behaviors. 
So let's start back in the early 2000s. So in the 2000s, before social media became a thing, most everybody was communicating on message boards. Message boards aren't exactly that safe of an environment. Most are very actually fairly toxic when they don't aren't moderated. Moderators play a very interesting and important role online. They usually aren't paid, and what they are supposed to do is kind of keep the guardrails in the discussion. Because as you know from the web, is that everything sort of just moves to the extremes even without social media algorithms. And people put opinions up that aren't regulated, so they're kind of free to say whatever they want. However, when you're free to say whatever you want, you do have to keep some walls up, otherwise people are gonna be pretty interested in saying things that are pretty aggressively bad and usually full of hate speech. Now remember what we talked about uh, about amendments on other times is that you are allowed to say the freedom of speech allows you to say whatever you want That's what the freedom of speech is However, the restriction on the freedom of speech is that you are also liable for the consequences of your speech So it doesn't mean you're free completely. It just means you're free You can't be jailed by the government for saying anything, but you are still liable for what you can say and moderators can choose that most every platform you exist and all the social media that you interact with and every platform that's online is part of some side of some sort of private property. And inside of that private property, there's rules. That's just how it works. There are rules in every private property. Remember, I, I think I've said this in here, if I haven't, card counting is technically not illegal. You, if you learned how to read or count cards and know how to play blackjack because you're somehow figuring out the number of cards that are missing, you could do that, it's legal. However, you're on, private property and they could tell you to get off the property because you're you're gaming their system. So it has nothing to do with the illegality of card counting. It has to do with the private property's rules as to what is negotiably allowed or not. One of the weird things that happened in the 2000s, from about 2000 to 2010, was creating the web as a privileged safe space, so to speak, for disenfranchised people. People that felt like the system was no longer working in their favor. People who felt like they were disengaged from the civic norms. People who had either been politically discharged from the environment or post 9-11 feeling as if they were politically unaware of how to maintain a, a good future. Or, in some cases, um, feeling as if there was a change in the culture. And the culture had shifted to the point where in the terms of negative media, had inspired a fear of replacement, a fear that uh, the pluralism of the United States was pushing white people towards a minority, or the fear that feminism had succeeded and men can no longer get the jobs they used to, none of which were real. In an old quote that I heard on Tumblr somewhere around that time, which is sometimes equality feels like to oppression, equality feels like oppression to those who have never felt the, that before. If you've never had, if you've always been privileged enough never to think about oppression, sometimes when you see other people becoming, moving up to your level, you experience that as oppression. And that's maybe a fear that's built into you. And that's where that term privilege even comes from. Privilege is the ability to not think of something. That's what that is. Or the ability to make a mistake and recover. That's what privilege really comes down to. So when you hear the term privilege, it means that you don't think of something. So people could have inherent bias uh, on privilege. So your inherent bias is economic, peer, race, gender. It means that you don't have the, you don't wake up every day thinking about something that somebody else thinks about all the time. If you are a person of color, a black or brown person, every day you are thinking of your race in some cases. I can't generalize that as a whole, but you are very often thinking of your race, whereas a white person may not often think about their race on a daily basis. That's a privilege. If you are ma white male, if you are a male, you're not often thinking about yourself in the workplace because you are, not, you are systematically uh, engaged in a privileged space. You're not thinking about how gender comes into play. These types of behavior can manifest in weird spaces online in fear. So when people feel fear, they express themselves in a way online that may not be expressed in physical space due to consequences. The ability to have anonymity on the internet allows people to express themselves much more aggressively. On the other hand, anonymity is extremely important. It allows people who are already in a not so great space, a place of marginalization, a place where they don't have the ability to express themselves, the ability to express themselves safely. So there is that gray area because anonymity plays a very, very important role in safety and expression where it's not allowed, but also can be abused by bad actors that don't use it correctly. I use the term bad actor and good actor here or good faith and bad faith. 
So good faith means the ability to act, be have agency, personal agency, to make a decision that is thinking in the way that is not hurting somebody else as you act. A bad faith actor is somebody who has a second motive, a second, uh, a second desire to do something that's either monetary, pain, violence, or so forth. They're doing something that has a second uh, goal to it. So oftentimes you'll hear me use the term grifter. A grifter is a bad faith actor because oftentimes their priority is not aiding the listener, but benefiting their own personal income. And so that's a bad faith actor. Some of the people in the early 2000s weren't bad faith or good faith, so to speak. They were, didn't have really guidance on how to use this. They just knew there's a space of expression. And so that ended up manifesting in two different ways in the mid 2010s after these, um, boards had happened. So in the 2000s, there were these strange misogynistic spaces that had popped up. They were called uh, PUA and the game, pickup artistry. It was a very misogynistic term for young men who are trying to basically uh, work in a community to figure out how to uh, pick up women. It was, it was terrible because it was objectifying women in, in all of its ways. They, they felt empowered that they had control over a situation that they felt they were losing grip on. Now keep remembering the terms I'm using. They felt. This is fear. This has nothing to do with reality. This is fear that's built into this. In the 2010s, gaming started becoming much more progressive. The idea of progressive thought, um, the ability for other voices to be heard, um, inspired both by Tumblr and other places, people started figuring out that they could amplify their own voices and use the current existing platforms to actually do the things that were once forbidden, if not inaccessible, to people who had marginalized voices. So people started making web series that included uh, queer storylines or people of color's uh, struggle or people who were de dealing directly with depression or hurt or pain, things that couldn't have been said earlier because the system itself, traditional media structures, did not allow that type of voice to come out into those spaces. There's actually a phenomenal book on web television by Amar Christian called Open TV, which is an examination of how originally marginalization, the idea that you can get access to traditional media structures, the web provided this actual space for this. However, when we started seeing web television being created and people using the web in the early 2010s, we noticed that it was just duplicating traditional media structures. So in the end of the 2010s, people's voices started coming out. And that's when uh, a game designer named Zoe Quinn designed a game called Depression Quest. And this game was designed specifically to not be the kind of game that you would normally play. It was not a game that was meant to be fun. It was a game designed to kind of make you think about the way people navigated their mental spaces in digital platforms. It was a new type of game and it, rec it was widely recognized as a sign of progress, that feminism itself had a way of saying words into the, into the gamer space, which was traditionally uh, masculinity based or male oriented. But women can have a role in this, not only as writers, but as game designers. However, uh, her ex-boyfriend at that time decided to write a horrible and horrific screed against Zoquin that became what we now call Gamergate. And Gamergate was an event, and arguably this event, this phenomenal phenomenon event, is still the world we live in today. This event was a reactionary backlash against Zoquin's success. And what it did was be basically frame her falsely in ways that she was accused of cheating on the, bo the, the, the boyfriend. She was accused of using her gender to, her, to, uh, to basically get her success out there, all of which was made up. It's just fear expressing itself. It actually then becomes so incredibly wrapped into right-wing media that it becomes amplified by people like Milo Yiannopoulos, who basically started wearing it as a flag, trying to grift off of this event. So the men's rights activists, MRAs, and anti-feminists started bringing up Gamergate as a structural cause. This 2014 event is likely what we still feel to this day. It's this anxiety of anger and false, uh, the term catachresis, which is the ability to use words incorrectly. So white male marginalization is a catacritic term. It doesn't actually mean what you think it means. Those terms don't actually work. It's not even oxymoronic. It doesn't have an existence, but because social media itself is such an enclosed space, it can feel that way. Social media does a phenomenal job of making you feel like the whole world exists right where you are. For those of you who use Twitter, you know this. There's often this phrase that's used on Twitter called Twitter is not real life. And the reason we consistently use the term Twitter is not real life is because it feels like it. 
But remember, Twitter only has about 400 million users and only about 80 million of which are talking at any given time. Most everybody else is just listening or not communicating. But that is an extremely small sample size. But Twitter plays an important role in social media because it's where all the journalists are. So you kind of feel like it's real life. You feel like it. When you spend enough time on any, any message board, regardless of where that is, if you're in any of them for too long of a time, you could start to feel as if that encompasses your existence. And so when voices are not heard from the outside, you have no um, ability to go out and talk about it, you could often feel as if this is the representation of what is actually happening outside. Now, what if we add algorithms? What if you add the ability for something to predict a future to this already fearful environment? When you start doing that, you start predicting these outcomes. You start pushing people into what we call rabbit holes. And rabbit holes, you may know, it may know from any type of term. Rabbit holes could be just reading on Wikipedia until you're just like three or four in the morning and you figure out something about like the Great Lakes that you never knew before. It could also be pushing you down these very tight information cycles that are completely based on disinformation or misinformation. They could be completely falsified, but they're pushing you down because the algorithm sees your previous choices and sends it further. In a shocking and horrific example about Dylan Roof, we talked about with Google search results. Because the first search result on Google returned the concerned conservative citizens, citizens of concerned conservatives or something like that, it had facts from the FBI on it about black on white crime. On the very first search result that happened from Dylan Roof's search result based on when he asked about what is that like. The page had facts, but it also had omissions. It had missing information that put it in scalable understanding, context and meaning, which I always talk about as should not be a luxury, but is. And Dylan Roof started taking action, wrote a manifesto and struck out and was a mass murderer. This type of thing is caused by an algorithm that then, after seeing the false information as a first result, changed his algorithm forever. From there on, the lens in which Dylan Roof interacted with the web was forever shifted. We don't realize what that happens to us, that every time we do a search, from there on, our searches are never the same. All of you know this. If you click on an ad on something that you were interested in, maybe slightly interested, or even accidentally clicked on it, it shows up in everywhere. It shows up all over the place. It feeds insidiously through your search. And this is part of how just things work. Now, a simple ad looking for socks that you might have liked, and now all you see is sock ads, may be benign by comparison to other things. But when you see something where it comes to a false cabal, a, a fake, news, uh, conspiracy, it could start pushing you into dark spaces in which you believe or fear that this might actually be true. As Doug Rushkoff says, everything is chaos. There's reality is fairly chaotic. Things aren't really stable. We don't really know how things work. It's very hard to get a full understanding of the full structure of the things that just operate, that make our daily lives just sort of be. But in that chaos, there can be comfort. There can be the ability to know, to shrug it back and just be like, I can't control everything. I can control myself. But if you don't feel that, or if no one is giving you the ability to enfranchise you, to make you feel like your vote matters, to make it feel like you have a say in your community, you turn to the web, you turn to these spaces and your communities cohere those thoughts. They tell you, you know what? You might be right. That might be what you're really feeling. That might be it. But we don't really realize is that it becomes an addiction. Again, back to the reference that Doug Rushkoff makes is that the addiction comes from the likes, the dopamine hits that come from you posting something that's saying, you know, it's very possible that these dark forces can be in control. Like, 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 and you see those numbers rank up. And that codification, that feeling means that you're being rewarded for that. And that reward based system is what pushes us to concretize these ideas in our mind and say, I think I might be right. And then when enough people have that exact feeling, I think I might be right, they can say, let's meet up. Let's go outside and actually talk about this. Let's do this. And the next thing you know, people are showing up at board of ed meetings, trying to basically accuse teachers of teaching something that doesn't exist at all. Or people are showing up to the US Capitol to argue about something that literally does not exist it is the rally for the unreal. Ben uh, Baldriard would be fascinated by this, who, uh, if Baldriard, Simulacra and Simulations. It's basically we can exist in physical space now in a complete simulation of something that is the unreal. It doesn't exist. 
No one stole the election. This is just how they work. No fraud existed, but the big lie persists. And people showed up. And the most shocking moment when I saw the insurrection was a man running up the Capitol steps wearing a Pepe hat and a Kekistani flag. Kekistan being the false uh, and fake country of the internet that is based somewhere deep inside of a mix between racist tropes and odd uh, anti-democratic behaviors. And that scene, that image, that still shows me that somebody was willing to wear the internet into our government spaces. That's power. I mean, that's power. The fact I'm talking about it now means that they carry power. That means they took the internet to the physical space. It isn't just anonymous protesting Scientology. This is the anti-democratic behavior, something that could collapse all that we've known. And if you think that things are already chaotic and uncontrollable, could you imagine what would happen if we actually took this down? There is no version of the other side. There is no, we could have a revolution and then it comes out and becomes something else. There are people who literally want to accelerate a collapse, but we don't have an answer for what is post-collapse. The only thing you could do is understand that the most important thing you have around you is to understand that people matter, that you could care for them, and you could be in a place that collectively we could be concerned for what's happening, especially in this change. Brian Keeley of Pitzer College actually said something very important to Ben Collins about this, and he wrote, you have to remember that a lot of these people are just the last believers in an ordered universe. And I think that's really important. Similar to that quote of Tumblr about equality and oppression, I think it's important to keep in mind that it is the believers in the ordered universe. Sometimes these extreme theories make a lot of sense because they're ordered. They make sense because somebody put them together, they put these details in space, and they look like answers. When you are seeking an answer and you're fearful, sometimes things don't have an answer. But sometimes people give you the answer and you say, you know what, that might be true. That's an ordered universe that may not exist. And that's not to scare you to say that everything is chaotic and nothing makes sense and we should just go and be nihilists. That's not true at all. What we should know is that we exist, we have agency, our friends exist, our family members exist, and our communities exist. And one of the things that David Nywert writes in the book Red Pill, Blue Pill, which is a book about extremism, and if you have the time and the heart to go through it, it's an excellent book. Uh, if you have the time to read it, it's about a history of all these violent incidences from Dylan Roof to the Norway shooter to the synagogue shooter to the, the man who plays pipe bombs in CNN. These are all different people that have been radicalized via the web, via social media, via the predictive algorithms that have pushed them into these darker spaces. But he ends it with this. He ends up with reminding us that there's a way to kind of reconnect. There's maybe a way to connect with people who may feel that extremism is normal, that this is no longer extreme. They only see it through the lens of I've normalized this and you're extreme. They're seeing you as the other, somebody who is not on their page. Keep in mind that there's grievances everywhere. We all feel it. Something bothers us. Something isn't working right. Classes aren't red loading right. We aren't getting our homework to assign on, on Blackboard. We uh, missed our paycheck. Uh, we're behind on rent. We don't understand why the landlord's raising rent. We don't understand why my, the car dealer is not having cars available for us when ours don't work. All of these are tiny, teeny, tiny fears that are starting to manifest. And when they do, that's a grievance. We are each are feeling them. And what we have to do is listen. That's the most important key to getting people out of extremist spaces is hear them. Hear them and listen to them and see what they are talking about. What is that grievance? And maybe, this isn't a, this isn't 100%, this is very optimistic, but it is possible to find a common ground. Because when we could share an objective reality, we could see through their subjective realities, the ones that have been concretized or extremified through these algorithms. And we could see through them and start saying, I see where you're coming from with that. However, that isn't based in this reality. But at least we have the starting point. We have the ability to say, I see where you're coming from. And maybe, just maybe, that's a way of reaching somebody. It is an optimistic view. I can I'll immediately say that. That is not shared by most people. But I do believe that if we do find the way we find uh, where people's fear persist and how to acknowledge them and maybe try to figure out how communities can engage to move past that, it can be important. The pandemic was not healthy for many of us. The pandemic put us inside. And by be, being inside and being safe, by being told we are being keeping each other safe, we were being told the collective action was important, but at the same time, not giving the answers to an objective reality. Being outside and being in community helps us 
basically field some of these extremist ideas. When something sounds not right, it usually isn't. If something's too good to be true, it usually is. And so when we talk to people outside, we say, oh, you know what? Thank you for giving me that clarity, that ability to see through some of these weird things. But by being inside, being not in class, by not being on campus, by not being out in our communities, we have the internet. That's what we had. And so back to Carol, our fictional AI that was basically built by Facebook. This is not going to be a great week for Facebook. There is, the embargo has been lifted. There's gonna be articles all week about all the things that Facebook knew that they were doing, that they were helping people become extreme, that they were turning people into people that would be willing to join QAnon or join uh, an insurrection. They knew, and that's not great. On their, on their side, they say, well, at least we're doing these studies. On the other hand, maybe just don't make your system do that. <laughs> so it is this very nebulous space. And we're going to be following this for the next, uh, this is interesting semester because we're going to be following this for pretty much the rest of the semester, but in the background because the class does go on and this is a survey course and there is a lot to cover. So thank you for sticking it through this lecture. This has been uh, a bit of a long one, but I think this is a really important topic to cover. And it is something that if we're not, um, interrogating this or talking about it, uh, we basically become complicit in it. And I don't like that. I don't feel that that's a good idea. I think we should be thinking about our the people around us, thinking about where pain exists, think about where people are in fear, thinking about people who don't have things as well as we do. We're very privileged to be in college. We're very privileged to be taking courses. Many people don't. Some of us are privileged to feel safe, some many don't, you know? So it's like, it's really important for us to kind of get a grip on how we can help those who may not be safe and what we can do collectively to make a better world for the future. And that's always why I tell you to stay curious and stay vigilant is because we have to, it's part of what's happening. Because if we don't have control over these opaque black boxes of the social media networks and we can't see how they're working, that means we don't really know how to have our version of reality interact with a version that doesn't we have no control over. So if we feel disenfranchised by the government, imagine how we should feel when we're talking about social media. It's just a lot to know, a lot to learn, but the more we're aware and the more we care, the better off that the future is going to be.